Have you ever felt so scared where your world slows down? You feel yourself floating above your body, watching it all unfold like a movie. Or think about an argument where you suddenly go numb. Your mind blanks, your emotions switch off, and the world feels like it isn't quite real. That's dissociation. And here's what many don't realize. For individuals with trauma, this isn't just a fleeting glitch. It's survival, the brain's emergency escape hatch when danger feels inescapable. But here's the issue. If we as clinicians don't recognize dissociation, we can re-traumatize the very people we're trying to help. In this video, I'll take you into the neuroscience of dissociation, show you the pitfalls, and share how to treat patients safely and effectively. Most people and many clinicians think PTSD is equal to hyperarousal, flashbacks, panic, nightmares. But that's only half the picture. The other half is dissociation, numbness, detachment, out-of-body experiences. Same trauma, two opposite brain states. So here's my plan for this video. First, we'll cover what dissociation really is. Second, the brain circuits and the neurotransmitters behind it. Third, the clinical pitfalls and why missing dissociation can make therapy harmful. And finally, the treatment strategies to address dissociation. I'm Dr. Singer Rege, consultant psychiatrist and educator. I've trained over 10,000 mental health professionals globally, and dissociation is one of those topics where getting it wrong has serious consequences. So let's get started. What is dissociation? Dissociation isn't just zoning out or daydreaming. It's a disconnection in consciousness, a disruption in how thoughts, emotions, memory, identity, and perception normally integrate. Patients may describe it as, I lose time. I don't remember chunks of my day. It feels like I'm watching myself outside my body. The world feels dreamlike, unreal. And here's the paradox. Dissociation is the brain's protective mechanism. When fighting or fleeing isn't possible, the brain shuts down awareness. So let's look at the two faces of trauma. Textbooks describe PTSD as hyperarousal with intrusive memories, panic, hypervigilance, nightmares. But research shows another pathway. Dissociation, flat affect, emotional numbness, depersonalization, derealization, and identity confusion. Here's the neuroscience. In hyperarousal, the prefrontal cortex, the brain's brake system, fails. The amygdala, our fear center, runs wild. This is also known as the emotional undermodulation type of PTSD. In dissociation, known as the emotional overmodulation type, the brakes slam too hard. The prefrontal cortex over inhibits the fear system. Same trauma, opposite circuitry. This is why one patient shakes with fear, whilst another looks detached, almost robotic. If you treat them identically, you can re-traumatize one. So how does the brain pull this off? Let's explore the neuroscience. You see, the brain has a defense cascade. Think of it as a survival algorithm. First, threat detected, noradrenaline, adrenaline, fight or flight. Two, escape blocked, freeze. Third, inescapable danger, shutdown. It's this shutdown that's dissociation. At the center of it is the periaqueductal gray, known as PAG in the brainstem. You see, when exposed to inescapable threat, a region in PAG triggers the parasympathetic drive, slowed heart rate, fainting, and detachment. It's the evolutionary biological equivalent of playing dead. The neurotransmitters play an important role. But here, instead of noradrenaline and adrenaline, we have mu opioids that numb pain. Kappa opioids distort consciousness, out-of-body dreamlike states. And endocannabinoids, these reduce arousal, calming, the amygdala. The physiological signatures, blunted heart rate, reduced skin conductance and altered cortisol rhythms. So to summarize, what happens when exposed to threats, the defense cascade starts off with sympathetic drive, but when the threat overshoots, we move into parasympathetic mode 
as a compensatory defense mechanism. And that's when the brain shuts down. So why should clinicians spot dissociation? Here's a scenario. You start exposure therapy with a trauma patient. They begin recounting their story. Midway, their eyes blaze. They're staring through you. Their speech flattens. That's dissociation in session. Instead of integrating memory, the brain has reactivated its shutdown pathway. Therapy reinforces the dissociation rather than resolving or processing the trauma. This is why assessment of dissociation is non-negotiable. Questions you can use, do you lose time or have memory blanks? Are there times when you feel detached from your body? Does the world ever feel unreal? If yes, dissociation may be present and treatment must adapt. Now, clinicians can use certain scales to evaluate dissociation. I've covered this in more detail in the article in the Neuroscience of Dissociation here. So how do we adapt? Let's talk about treatment strategies. The rule of thumb is match the intervention to the state. If hyperarousal is present, downregulate. Use grounding, breath work, mindfulness, soothing, regulation, and of course, medication as necessary. If dissociation is present, upregulate. Use activation, sensory input, bright light, movement. Here's a critical pitfall. Relaxation techniques in a dissociative state can worsen shutdown. Medications such as benzodiazepines do the same. So for trauma memory work, use the three-phase model. First, safety and stabilization. Teach grounding and reality testing. Two, processing trauma. Keep the patient anchored, eyes open, continuous engagement. And third, integration, helping them reconnect with life roles. Skip phase one and the foundation collapses. Let's look at the role of medications. Evidence is limited, but here's what we know. Because threat begins with hyperarousal, it becomes important to address hyperarousal. However, one can't just stop there. One has to then move towards addressing dissociation. Naltrexone or naloxone may help by blocking opioid-driven dissociation. Medications that address hyperarousal, such as clonidine or low-dose SSRIs, can provide some stability. Meds can support, but psychotherapy tailored to the brain state is essential. So let me summarize all of this for you. Dissociation is the brain's emergency escape hatch. It's survival, not weakness. It's driven by brain circuits, PAG, and prefrontal limbic connections. And neurotransmitters play a part, different from the hyperarousal state. Here, opioids and cannabinoids play a role. Clinically, assess before exposure therapies. Match the treatment to the brain state. Use phase-oriented therapy. That means recognizing the phase the patient's in. Medications help, but aren't the only treatment. Dissociation isn't absence. It's the brain's way of staying alive when life feels impossible. When we understand it and treat it with nuance, we give patients more than therapy. We give them safety. If this resonated with you, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And if you're a clinician wanting to master these nuances, explore our trauma curriculum at the Academy by Psych Scene. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, and thanks for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.